Now, yes, thank you very much. Um, thank you very much for inviting me to this meeting, and uh, I'm very happy to be here. It's a beautiful place, and I'm going to talk about gold ladder polyps. To me, a bit of a complex subject, but you will probably help me in the end with some questions. So, the buttons. There. So, I'm going to talk about the problem, the incidence, radiology, what we could do, risk factors, suggestion about follow-up algorithm, and some conclusions. So, what is the problem with polyps? Yes, gold bedded polyps are very common, and there is only a small portion of them that are true edomatous polyp polyps with a risk of malignancy. So, the vast majority are benign cholesterol polyps but they may be very hard to differentiate from each other with radiology. And is there really a polyp to malignancy transformation, or are they just most of them keeping benign? Are there risk factors? And if so, should we search for polyps, or should we search for cancer? There will be lots of unnecessary surveillance. Is that cost effective? And there will also be a risk of lots of unnecessary operations. But what I think most, as you have read articles and what you practice in, at home, is that if they're more than 10 millimeters, you would operate. And if they're growing during surveillance, you would also recommend surgery. And also, if you have distinct pain patterns, you will probably also operate. In patients with primary sclerosis and cholangitis, the recommendation might also be to operate independent of size. And most of you might have some sort of follow-up in polyps between 5 and 10 millimeters, but for how long? And if you operate, should you do it at a center that can do liver surgery at the same time, cancer surgery, or should you do the polyps anywhere? So the prevalence, as I've said, is very high. It's in different studies between 0.3% up to 10%. So it's sometimes even more common than gold stones, a bit more common in females, a bit less in India, surprisingly, as gold bladder cancer is quite common. Risk factors for having a polyp is hepatitis B and metabolic syndrome. But only 0.6 of all detected polyps are actually true polyps. If you look at patients who have finally been operated for the polyps, so that differentiates, of course, if you have a center that operates very small polyps, you will have a different pattern from centers that operate only the big ones. But about 82-83% are benign, and about 70 or 17 are premalignant or malignant. But in many places in articles, you'll find that only a third of the patients operated, that you actually find a polyp in the gold bladder specimen. So only 6% of the operations were actually necessary. So can we now somehow separate the true polyps from benign to reduce the number of surgeries and maybe reduce the follow-up? There have been quite a few different techniques tried. One of these is contrast-enhanced endoscopic ultrasound. They looked at 90 polyps. They found 29 out of 33 of the malignant polyps, but they also found, uh, which is less than a 90% finding rate, and they concluded that they are much better in polyps above 10 millimeters, so they, this is not working in smaller ones. In Asia, they're going in the other direction. In Europe, the tendency is to operate smaller polyps, but in Asia, it's going towards operating bigger polyps, despite the fact that they're more malignant polyps in the Asian studies. So here's a paper recommending they shouldn't operate until they're more than 14 millimeters. They had 136 patients with polyps about 10 millimeters, but the accuracy was less than 90%, so you will miss quite a few patients if you follow this strategy. So contrast-enhanced ultrasound, then, could that be something? Yes, you could distinguish a bit in between the benign and malignant, but there is a great overlap between the two methods. And what they look at is a broad stalk, or what we say a sessile sto uh, stalk of the, of the polyp. That is the difference between the two, and also contrast enhancement. But it's not, there's a big overlap, so you should be very careful with this. And the authors conclude that they suggest that if you think it's a cholesterol polyp, you, su you should still continue your follow-up. So it's not really helpful. FDG PET or PET-CT has also been tried. It's also, again, about 90% accuracy. 
they missed three malignant out of the 21, 20 malignant, but they found three out of four of the neoplastic polyps. Still, it's lots of patients missed. And also, from your own work in Ankara by the radiology group, have looked at real-time elastography, and they found 52 benign cold body polyps, and all had a high-strain elastographic pattern. They had only one malignant, and that had a low strain, but the material is probably still too small. And I think it was only a quarter of the ones of the 52 benign that were operated with a final pathology. So in conclusion re regarding radiology, separation of benign from true polyps may be possible when they are above 10 millimeters, but the accuracy is not more than 90%. Contrast enhanced endoscopic ultrasound and PET-CT could be used in polyps more than 10 millimeters if you have maybe severe comorbidity or you want to prepare to, for cancer surgery to be a bit more sure that you might need cancer surgery, then it could be used. But it's not to exclude patients, I don't think, at the moment. And none of these techniques can help us to reduce the surveillance population. It's still there in the same size. So at what cutoff size should cholecystectomy be recommended? In this study from America, they studied 346 patients. They found no malignant or adenomatous polyps less than 7 millimeters. But if the cutoff would be at 10 millimeters, they would only need to operate 3% of the patients. And the ones that were larger than 10 millimeters, 15% were malignant, but only one of the ones below. So they recommended only to operate about 10 millimeters. And in this systematic review by Babu, come to the same conclusion that there is a very low risk of not operating patients below 10 millimeters as long as they are not growing during surveillance. They found no neoplastic polyps below 5 millimeters and they don't recommend follow-up in smaller ones. They also found that the Asian population have a larger risk of malignancy compared to Europe. They recommended one year follow-up in European populations and three years in Asian. Now, the growth rate, this is a review with 10 articles looking at growth rate, and they also find that malignant polyps, or polyps with malignant potential, have a growth rate of 0.37 millimeters per month. So they think that there is evidence for looking at the growth rate and evidence for follow-up, but the length of it they could not recommend. 2.2% of the neoplastic polyps were found uh, among the patient although they found quite a few less than 10 millimeters, but most of them were growing polyps. The same were found by the group of Park in 2009. Their own work in one center had 59 and 58 patients. They also found a bit more than 2% of increase in size and 25% of them were neoplastic. So growth, again, is a risk factor along with the size of the polyp if the patient has gallstone. They follow their patients for about three years, so they recommend longer follow-up than in the previous paper. Now, the question of primary sclerosis in cholangitis. This is a, a study from Denmark looking at 4,333 patients with cholangitis, and a subgroup of these, 178, had primary sclerosis in cholangitis. And as you probably are aware, there is a high risk of cancer the first half year after detecting primary sclerosis and cholangitis. Not only gallbladder cancer, but also bile duct cancer and primary hepatic cancer. But if you find a polyp in this population, you have a risk of cancer above 50%. That's why the American Association of the Study of Liver Disease recommended yearly ultrasound in this group and cholecystectomy in all polyps and also if changes in the gallbladder wall. But you should also be aware of that these patients have lots of comorbidity and have an increased risk of complications during surgery. So you should really have them at MDT before you decide what to do uh, and really talk to the patient before so they are aware of the increased risk of complication of the surgery. We follow this algorithm for this patient group. We do CT thorax and, and MRI abdomen and have MDT. If we see changes in the bile duct system at the same time, we do, do spy glass, ESOP and spy glass and biopsies and fish analysis on these before gallbladder surgery. 
If there are no changes in the bad duct system, we go for laparoscopic cholecystectomy and do laparoscopic ultrasound of the gallbladder wall. If it's even, we do the whole operation laparoscopically, but if we find that it looks like overgrowth in the liver, we convert to open surgery and do frozen section of the polyp. If it's cancer, we continue with the cancer operation in the same surgery. Now, there are risk factors, of course. As I've said before, sessile polyps, size about 10 millimeters, but also age over, the, over 60 years. And if you add these factors, you have a, quite, quite an increased risk of malignancy in the patients. So that should also be taken into account. You have strengthened these results in, in your pre work recently where you also found that the size of the polyp and the morphology of the polyp were risk factors in multivariable analysis. And also you found age uh, at the same time and solitary polyps. So come together with risk factors. We've seen age, gallstones. I haven't talked about symptoms, but quite a few papers have talked about symptoms. And localized symptoms have causes a five times increase in the risk of gallbladder cancer. Size increase during surveillance, Asian population, primary sclerosis and cholangitis, and as I said before, sessile polyps. Now, is there really an adenoma to carcinoma sequence in gallbladder polyps? This is very common, as you know, in cor colorectal cancer. The first report for gallbladder polyps came already in 1982 by Kosuko. He looked at 1,605 polyps and he found 18 true polyps. None of the smaller ones had any signs of malignancy, but seven out of eight of the bigger ones had malignant transformation, and 20% of all cancers had also adenoma tissue, indicating that there is a subgroup of gallbladder cancer that comes from this adenoma to carcinoma sequence. To make it a bit more complicated, Two studies by human pathology in 1999 looked at mutation in gallbladder cancers. And they found distinguished mutations in dysplasia, carcinoma in situ, and invasive cancer. And they could not find these in the adenomas. On the other hand, in 25% of the adenomas, they found KRAS mutations, indicating that this is a different type of cancer coming from polyps than the ones just springing straight out of the wall. So they might be a different population, but they, they will be cancers or have a risk of becoming cancers. With this in mind, there has been a risk and cost effectiveness analysis by CANS and colleagues where they assume that all true polyps are premalignant and the surveillance policy could potentially detect and prevent 5.4 gallbladder cancer per 1,000 individuals per year and giving a cost saving of more than 200 US dollars per year. They recommended, they followed the, the rule that they should operate if they're about 10 millimeters and if they were growing. And what is happening when you, during surveillance? Oh, you will find that about two thirds of them don't change in size or in numbers, but a quarter of them will increase in, in either number or size, but at the same time, they will decrease in number and size at, in about the same amount. Only 6.6% .6 of the polyps increase in size during the surveillance period. We have looked in Swedish material. We have one registry for all cholecystectomies in Sweden. Sweden is a small country. We only have 10 million inhabitants. We're doing 12,000 cholecystectomies per year. And these are the years between 2007 and 2014. We did 1,282 cholecystectomies due to polyps. So only 1.8% of all the cholecystectomies. And we found polyps in the gold burden in, in every third of the gold bladders that once they were resected. And 6.2% of the operation found neoplastic polyps. We don't have data on size or on growth, so I can't give you data on that. These guidelines just came out from two societies, or three societies, from radiology and endoscopic societies, and they're giving very detailed surveillance suggestions. They recommend surgery if they are between five and nine millimeters and have any risk factor, if they grow more than two millimeters, we should operate. But they also recommend surveillance in any size of polyp and up to five years. To me, this would give lots and lots of more surveillance and lots and lots of more surgery 
and I'm not sure that we can handle this. These are the guidelines we use in Sweden now. If we find a gallbladder polyp, if they have primary sclerosis and cholangitis, if they have symptoms, or if they're above 10 millimeters, we recommend surgery. If they are 5 to 9 millimeters, we do follow up with ultrasound for two years every six months. If they grow or patient develop symptoms, we take them to liver MDT. And if they're above 10 millimeters, we operate them at liver centers, or if they're below, they could operate at any place uh, or uh, uh, surgery, of course, that are know how to operate polyps and are careful we're not uh, ruining the gallbladder. Additional risk factors, as I've said, H, gallstones, and sessile polyps. If they don't grow, if they are reducing in size, we stop surveillance. So in conclusion, polyps are very common, but very few are malignant. A minority of the gallbladder cancers come from polyps, maybe about 20%. PET-CT and contrast enhanced ultrasound may differentiate polyps if they're more than 10 millimeters, but as I said, only 90% accuracy. We need new methods to separate true polyps from benign when they're less than 10 millimeters. There is a true adenoma uh, that uh, true adenoma may transform to cancer, and a large number of patients will be followed with any kind of guidelines. Follow-up and surgery when indicated is cost effective, but it's still uncertain how long this follow-up should be. Thank you.